Welcome back to another edition of the Post Media Ottawa Senators panel. I'm Bruce Garriott with Ken Warren in Ottawa, and we're pleased to be joined by two-time Olympic gold medalist uh, Cheryl Pounder. And Cheryl, it's uh, nice to see you again. Cheryl, yeah. let's, uh, let's start with the uh, with the postponement. I want to keep wanting to say cancellation. <laughs> the postponement of the women's world championships in in halifax i know you were headed there to do some color analysts for the uh, the tsm broadcast this has to be devastating for 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 the competitors yeah i was afraid to put in the call to a few of my my former teammates and friends and on the team and working with the staff just because i know how heartbreaking and devastating uh, it would have been. I, I know I've said before that I was part of the world championship team that uh, was told uh, a couple days prior to heading over to China that uh, we wouldn't be going due to SARS. And I, I remember the feeling and just that angst, you know, that the work you've put in, but also recognizing that something bigger than yourself is going on. But it's just so, so difficult. And in this situation, it is so much different because it's been two years yeah. since any meaningful competition for these women and recognizing as a pandemic and people need to make decisions uh, to ensure there's health and safety. But these women were there. Uh, they, for all intents and purposes, were 100 percent thinking it was moving ahead after all of the protocols had gone underway. And the chief medical officer the day before saying, yeah, we, we feel like they're not a threat at this time, in my opinion. So to have that. Uh, just on the heels of what would have been a great championship was really devastating for them. And, you know, when you put in that time and effort for your dream, it's very, very difficult. And so, you know, my heart goes uh, to all of them, all of the international players as well who are in quarantine and some of them heading towards their charters at the same time. And, and what this means uh, from a female hockey perspective in terms of the growth and the development of the game is probably something that's, that's larger uh, when we look at it from where the game is going and headed so very difficult time for for everyone involved and and a lot of question marks for some people for sure obviously this is this is a covid situation self and hate yeah. and health and safety circumstance but the whole women's hockey movement and trying to get established and what yeah. what so many professional players are trying to do uh to get the game somewhere and how difficult you know you need these these this this um showcase to, to get a chance to show what the game is right and how difficult is yeah. it when things keep getting shutting down you know in in a weird way you know when i played it, it almost seems not that we're taking a step backwards but when you look at where we are today and i think not having this championship has magnified that there isn't one league that's that's out there that uh, these women are playing in collectively that's being established and is really presenting itself. I think, you know, a lot for these women in particular who are on their national teams, they, they haven't been playing anywhere in the interim either. And so when you talk about the little girls in the game, you know, my daughters, the girls that I coach, I always come back to, I want them to have the opportunity to watch, you know, Mitch Marner or Jason Spezza or Josh Norris or Connor McDavid play. You know, we want them to see a Shabbat and say, wow, they're amazing. But you also want them to look up and say, well, there's Natalie Spooner and there's Aaron Ambrose and where they have the opportunity to make the decision of who they want to cheer for. And that's hockey. And for them, they haven't had the opportunity to watch these women play in meaningful competition since 2019, really. There was a rivalry series, but since the World Championships when the CWHL also folded. So it's been sort of one thing after another for these women and knowing a lot of them, they are strong, they are resilient, and the game will grow because of these women. Uh, mark my words, it will grow because they're standing up for the next generation, not just themselves. This is certainly a tough blow when you've been training for months upon months uh, intermittently, because obviously, like many other athletes in the same position, they're, you know, their competition is very difficult. But this is just, this has been something that's been a def definitive blow to them. You know, Cheryl, they, 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 there's been an awful lot of, I think, I don't know if pushback is the right word. 
but there's been an awful lot of discussion that there was no plan B in place. Now, I, I do think in August, there will be August or September, we will see yeah. the tournament. Should there have been a plan B in place or, or was this just totally off guard? Well, I think it was off guard. I mean, there is question certainly now in hindsight, why was there not a plan B? Why couldn't it have been moved? And I think that's the question that a lot of people are asking. And I think it's on the heels of, you know, the women's game finding itself to be the one to not have championships. And then a lot of it's jurisdiction and, and all of those other things. But from a Hockey Canada and IIHF standpoint and just uh, chatting with Hockey Canada in particular, all the conversations that had happened were healthy uh, leading into uh, the World Championships. When they had the opportunity, when they rescheduled from April to May, Halifax had an opportunity to push it to August and they elected to go into May. And so when they were so close to the championships, I think they really felt because, you know, because Nova Scotia had done such a great job of containing the virus that they would be a go. But ironically, and, and you know, because they've done such a great job, it wound up being the thing that shut them down. So, so certainly this tournament needs to happen. It has to be a priority to get this game visible, not just for the global good and, and the greatness of the game and showcasing these amazing talents, but also you have an Olympics coming up. And how do you develop or how do you assess and evaluate these women in a fair environment whether you're a rookie or you're a veteran, so that you can vie to be on you know, your dream and Olympic team and represent your country. Well, and, and, and that's, that's the balance there too, right? Is, is where do you find that? And, and, and that's the issue that they're, they're going to face in all this is, is they have to get this done before the Olympics. And, and you even have to wonder if there's going to be an Olympics at this juncture, you know? Yeah, and I think, like anything, there's so much uncertainty with this pandemic, and we we have to take it, I guess, in stride in terms of things can change on a moment's instance. And so, you know, there is that recognition. But right now, the plan would be that we're going to, to move ahead as if there is going to be an Olympics. And so what needs to take place in order for us to field our strongest team in the fairest way possible? And so... If, you know, hopefully the women's team does have an opportunity to compete with this postponement and hopefully sooner than later, because they will in Canada in particular, they will they will move, they will relocate to train full time in Calgary to buy for those spots. Well, those team, women need to be notified and selected. So this tournament was a crucial, critical piece to that evaluation process. So what happens next? And Gina Kingsbury is the head of the program. She'll have to make some, some tough decisions going forward. And she will, uh, but about what this program's future looks like in the coming months. Well, one of the things, uh, and, and it'll be interesting to watch in the coming months, but one of the things if, that uh, that I wanted to, we wanted to talk about, Cheryl, is you've been doing some uh, analysis on the senator's broadcast on tsn yes i'm gonna I'm, I'm getting a bow tie i'm getting a bow tie by the way Bruce. just so you know <laughs> and um the, obviously matt murray has had just a disastrous season in ottawa um i'd like both of you to chime in on this he's likely done for the season now what what can be done for to make him have success next year I'll, I'll I'll jump in. I guess what can be done? I <laughs> you you've got to get if a fresh the goalie, like if I were the goalie coach, you know. <laughs> well, right. So, like, so you do your post mortem after the season. You sit down and go, okay, what went right over here and what went wrong over here, and you sit back and go, okay, was it no training camp? Was it no? Uh, was it not being familiar with your defense? What was it for? In Matt Murray's case. And you got to sit down and have some hard, hard discussions here on what you want to do. I mean, you know, one of the reasons he didn't wasn't originally scheduled to play the other night was worry about playing too much. He goes in and plays and pulls a is it a groin or whatever it is, or some kind of lower body injury. Well, that was one of the things they were worried about. So if you're going to overplay the guy, that now do you sit back? And go okay, this plan next year we're going to have to really limit how much he plays. Is that one of the many things you have to look at, but you got to go right back to the drawing board. This is a, the, I would say the big piece of, of, of moving on here. You need a number one goalie. Well, I, sure. I would, go ahead. Yeah, No, I was just going to say, I, I agree. And you look at the beginning, the start to the senator's um, 
at the beginning of the year and you know the goaltending obviously was an issue had they had stronger goaltending where would they be but when they brought in Zach Berkman, that's this is something that you know they're, they're trying to hit the reset button and to give Matt Murray and Hogberg an opportunity to get their A game back, if you will, because that is what is needed uh, in the pipes for this young group. They need those solid, consistent efforts to be able to, to push for that playoff spot. And I think they're showing that they can be contenders uh, with the heart and, and the pesky sense if you will, but they do need that goaltending. But, you know, the injury is something that they have to look at because Matt Murray comes back, he's, he's looking good, you know, shutouts, and then look where they're at again. So a lot has to go into the thought process around this position as they head into, um, you know, the, the summer for sure. Well, and, and the other thing that I think people want to see here down the stretch, and we'll wrap up here soon, is, is they want to see the young players play. And we've seen an awful lot of the young players mm -hmm. Down the stretch, we've seen Eric Brandstrom. One of the people, one of the guys that people want to see, Cheryl, is they want to see Jacob Bernard Docker, and they want to see him play. And, and are you hopeful that he gets an opportunity in these last seven or eight games? Absolutely, I say get him in. I think it. the The tough part is it's it's difficult, and I think you know you want to protect your players. And, and DJ Smith would certainly have, have an opportunity that we don't, and not seeing him in practice against. Uh, these NHL players, but they're all young. This is a great culture to bring a young defenseman into. And I think it presents an opportunity down the stretch here, but, you know, we're getting closer and closer to the end. And so, you know, the question remains, you know, they come off a win against Vancouver. Are they going to change it up? You know, DJ Smith mm -hmm. likes the feeling that he's got in his locker room right now. But for me, you know, I started as, as a young defenseman on the national team. Confidence is a big thing. But when you come in with like players around you, I mean, Kinto, I mean, playing together and you and D and, and, and having that familiarity, I think now is the time to, to throw these kids sort of into the pressure cooker and allow them to make mistakes now to get their feet wet to grow. The question and the difficulty is he already has a young D core. And so who do you take out? And when you've got, you know, a Zaitsev who's, who's strong to playing fairly well alongside Shabbat. And the question is you know, a lot of talk about Brown. So, and you've got Mete and Brandstrom who, who, you know, they're both five, nine, they're both small guys. So what are you going to do on that blue line to get them in? But certainly for me, uh, I, I'd be putting them in. Before we wrap here, Kenny, Mete has been a nice addition to for them, yeah. hasn't, hasn't he? That's a free addition, right? You go there and then you got to, you, you're going to get into uh, expansion draft issues here. Do you protect Mete and, and and the question is, do you protect Josh Brown? I, I, I you know, as much as JBD is going to be a part of the future here, uh, here's a here's an extended look at Josh Brown. And quite frankly, he's yeah. looked okay early in the year. He looked awful. So I don't know what's happened in between. Whether it had to do with playing with Coburn or different pairings back there when the goalie was struggling. You're getting a long look at at Josh Brown. Do you protect him? Is he going to be you know a bridge to to what happens next down the road? So. Um, the, the unfortunate part, I think, what this is, the Senators went out west, had a long road trip. Now Belleville is off for an extended period. You can't throw JVD down there to play because they're not uh, – he needs to play somewhere. I mean, practice is practice. I get that. But at some point, he's got to get into some games here. Well, yeah, it what? ain't the same. Practice just ain't the same. And uh, <laughs> you got to get up against these guys. And, you know, you're right about Josh Brown and, you know, the physical element and, and a little bit of sort of some veteran savvy. But – Certainly, you know, this is for me the opportunity to, to, to get him in and see where he is at, at this point in time when the Sens are, are playing well and with confidence. Well, Cheryl, we appreciate your time today. Thanks very much for joining us. For the Senators, for the Post Media Senators panel in Ottawa, I'm Bruce Garriott with Ken Warren, and thanks again to Cheryl Pounder.